Welcome to Sheridan College's Introduction to Instrumentation. This lesson is a part of Module 3, Temperature Instrumentation, and will focus on thermocouples. A thermocouple is a thermoelectrical device that uses the Seebeck effect and the Seebeck voltage derived from that effect to create a signal that is proportional to the heat exposed to the thermocouple's hot junction. A thermocouple works on two physical properties, on the differences in temperature and the reaction of the combination of dissimilar metals. A thermocouple is a simple device where two dissimilar metals are fused together. When the fused end is exposed to a heat that differs from the non-fused end, a voltage is created. The voltage thus created is very small, but is directly proportional to the difference in temperatures. That is, the greater the difference, the greater the voltage produced. The construction of commercial thermocouples can be very simple like the fused end style used in our lab experiments to sealed units as shown. On sealed units, the actual junction is at the tip and the internal wires are passed through a series of ceramic beads to the thermocouple cabling or board. Thermocouples can also be designed to fit inside a special housing called a thermal well, which assists maintenance when changing the thermocouple. At the connection end of the thermocouple, within the well, are the polarized contact terminal blocks. Each block matches the intended thermocouple wire. The connections in turn are mounted on a thermally uniform or isothermic block. Thermocouples have distinct advantages over mechanical or locally mounted thermometers. Reading locations may not be accessible in hazardous or toxic locations posing a danger to personnel. Mechanical thermometers are not easily automated. The process may be long distances away from the control room and in many cases kilometers away. And calibrated systems are not prone to recording or parallax errors and are more reliable. Thermocouples are primary sensory elements. Much like RTDs, they provide temperature readings and are usually connected to a temperature transmitter or temperature controller. Unlike RTDs in which the resistance changes, thermocouples produce small varying voltages due to thermal energy. There are eight different types of thermocouple classified by letter, which identifies the temperature range and the dissimilar metals used. By international standards, all thermocouples are constructed using different pairs of alloys for the conductors and have been assigned one of eight letters and color codes to determine the thermocouple type. The letter not only identifies the alloys, but also indicates the temperature range for the thermocouple. The two most common thermocouples used are J and K. Notice on this table of thermocouple characteristics that both R and S types measure the same temperature. The difference is in their signature voltage over temperature response curve. Another factor that separates these types is the thermoelectric difference called the Seebeck coefficient. The voltage curves and Seebeck coefficients are beyond the scope of this course and are mentioned here to ensure that you do not replace one thermocouple type with a similar ranged one, like swapping an R for an S. Closeness doesn't count. It won't work. The Seebeck effect is the reaction that some dissimilar metals will exhibit when joined together at each end and exposed to two different heat sources, whereby a current will flow between the two junctions at different temperatures. The voltage created by the Seebeck effect is called the Seebeck voltage. The Seebeck voltage is proportional to the difference in temperature between the two joints. In the diagram, there are two circuits. Each are connected at both ends. The top circuit is in thermal equilibrium, so no voltage is produced. The bottom circuit has a flame on one joint and cool vapors or ice on the other joint. This will produce a voltage. The voltage thus produced is directly proportional to the difference in the temperature between the two heat sources or joints. The greater the temperature difference, the greater the voltage produced. By using two dissimilar metal wires fused together at one end and left open at the other, thermocouples become electrical thermometers that can take advantage of the Seebeck effect and voltage. Working thermocouples have multiple junctions or connected points. Every place a wire is connected in the thermocouple circuit, it makes a junction. 
The thermocouple shown is made of copper and an alloy called constantan. Again, there are two junctions in our circuit. The red one will be exposed to a temperature source to be measured. This joint is called the hot or measuring junction. Be aware not to focus on the term hot. Think of it not as temperature, but as the source of the voltage. So it is hot as in live voltage. Or, to be safe, let's just call it the measuring junction. The blue junction is called the cold or reference junction. This will be opened later to connect the voltmeter. The reference junction is used to measure the voltage produced by the measuring junction due to any difference in temperature. Again, don't focus on the word cold strictly in terms of temperature. Let's apply some heat to the target material to be measured, say 90 degrees Celsius. The reference junction will remain at the ambient temperature of 25 degrees Celsius. As can be seen, a current caused by the Seebeck voltage begins to flow in the circuit. The Seebeck effect and voltage are named after Thomas Seebeck, who rediscovered the battery-like effect that heat had on some circuits with dissimilar metal conductors. Seebeck noticed that a compass needle deflected when two dissimilar metals were joined together at two different points or junctions, and when one junction was exposed to more heat than the other. When the reference junction is opened, a voltmeter can be installed to monitor the voltage being generated by the differential heat between the reference and measuring junctions. If the target heat is lowered, cooling the measuring junction, the voltage will drop proportionally. If the measuring junction equals the reference junction, then thermal equilibrium will kill the voltage. The Seebeck voltage depends on two main factors, the two metals used in the thermocouple and the temperature differential between the measuring and reference junctions. Here is a thermocouple measuring a blast furnace or similar heat. The reference and measuring junctions are so close to the source that the voltage readings are being affected and damaging the meter. Clearly, the reference junction has to be moved. The solution is to extend the circuit to a place where a proper temperature differential can be created by the distance and a cooler location for the reference junction. Notice that the new wires are different than the original. These are called extension wires. Okay, we have extended our thermocouple circuit to a different location, and we use different metal extension wires. If dissimilar metals and a difference in heat can cause a voltage, wouldn't this junction do so as well? The answer is yes. So we need to observe the law of intermediate metals, which tells us how to extend the circuit successfully. The law of intermediate metals states that a third metal in a thermocouple circuit does not affect the voltage, providing the temperature of the three metals at the point of the junction is the same. This means that more common conductor materials can be used. This has advantages such as cost and availability should the extension wires require replacement. Let's break the law down and see what it's saying. We don't want to create any new unintended Seebeck voltages at the extension junctions. The first part says we must ensure that the temperature of the extension junctions is the same. This is accomplished by connecting the wires on an isothermic block. An isothermic block is made from a material that is thermally uniform, that is, all points of the block are exactly the same temperature. The terminal screws on the block themselves are made of the same metal as the thermocouple, so we don't create another thermocouple. Keep this in mind if you ever have to change a thermocouple. Always observe polarity to avoid disaster. The second part mentions three metals. Since the measuring junction is made of two dissimilar metals, then the extension junction wires must be the same conductor metal. In our example, the three metals are iron, constantan in the measuring junction, and copper used for the extension wires. Let's use some critical thinking. Tell me, what's wrong with this picture? The answer? You cannot use your multimeter's copper leads to directly measure the thermocouple's Seebeck voltage. Why? Well, the simple answer is, you would create two new junctions, and they would develop their own 
Seebeck voltages. Okay, let's take a careful look at this circuit. So junction one is our intended measuring junction. Junctions two and three are supposed to be just connection points. However, they create their own Seebeck voltages. And those voltages oppose the thermocouple voltage. Remember that two factors make thermocouples work, dissimilar metals and a difference in temperature. Your multimeter introduces a dissimilar metal. J2 is a thermocouple junction of iron and the copper from the multimeter lead. And J3 is a thermocouple of copper and constantan. If there's any difference in the temperature between these two points, we will end up with another thermocouple circuit, which as we stated, opposes the original measuring junction voltage. Okay, so we took care of that with the isothermic block, right? Yes, but we're not controlling the temperature where the multimeter is, and that again creates a difference, and again we have a problem. So, we must therefore stabilize the temperatures at J2 and J3 to a fixed known temperature before the J1 voltage and temperature can be properly measured. This is beginning to sound like an impossible task. I mean, how on earth do you get the temperature at the measuring junction if the voltage produced keeps changing every time you try to read it? Well, fortunately, the answer lies in something called the law of intermediate temperatures. The beauty of this law's formula is that you can rearrange the formula to find the other components, as long as you know two of the three. Okay, let's set the temperature of the J2 and J3 junctions to a fixed value. First, we'll hermetically seal the junctions so there won't be any unintended temperature changes. Now, let's dump the whole thing into a nice tank full of freezing water. There, the junctions are set at 32 degrees Fahrenheit. And now, we can figure things out without worrying about J2 and J3's temperatures changing all the time. So now we can calculate the temperature of the measuring junction. We'll begin by rearranging the formula so we can determine what we need to know. After all, our objective is to determine the correct voltage at the measuring junction and then convert that into a temperature. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take a reading at the extension junction. Let's say it was 1.9 millivolts. Remember, we can only take readings from the extension junction. Okay, so we plug 1.9 millivolts into our equation. Great. Now, we have to measure the voltage at the reference junction. Oh, now that's going to be a problem. Because now, we have to somehow measure the voltage without a meter. Great. What is it going to be, a Houdini trick? Well, not a Houdini trick, a universal trick. Just like looking up the ampacity of a four-rod aluminum wire. Like RTDs, thermocouples are manufactured to very specific standards. Every thermocouple type has a thermoelectric voltage chart that can be referenced for converting a measured millivolt reading into a temperature based on the 32 degrees Fahrenheit or zero Celsius ice bath. The chart can also be used in reverse as you can verify the accuracy of a thermocouple by checking the voltage against a known temperature. So we set the value of our reference junction to 32 degrees Fahrenheit. We now need only to look that up on our table to get the reference junction. We know that zero Celsius is the same as 32 degrees Fahrenheit. So the chart is in Celsius, we're going to use that. Checking our table, we find under the zero column and the zero row, the voltage is, well, that makes life easy, it's zero millivolts. Now is a good time to observe something about this table. Notice that the millivolt reading of zero millivolts appears twice in our table. The blue circled one is in the zero row, while the red circled one is under the 10 column. 
Well, that's weird. Okay. <clears throat> Each column is one higher than the one to its left. So if we follow back to the left, we find the red circled zero occurs in the negative 10 row. Therefore, negative 10 adding 10 gives us zero. To interpret the chart, start with the left-hand column. This chart, for example, tells you that the measurements are in Celsius. Notice that the temperature counts in tens for each row. Now notice that there are 10 columns. The columns count away from the left in increments by one degree. This means if you want 15 degrees, you find the 10 row and move over 5 to 15. 10 plus 5. Let's practice. Let's look for 30 degrees. Okay, that's easy. It's in its own row under the zero column. But it was also found on the 20 row in the 10th column. They are both 1.537 millivolts, which is perfect because 30 equals 20 plus 10. Okay, that's easy. And let's look at the negative values. Okay, let's continue practicing. This time, let's try and find the millivolt measurement for negative 18. Okay, so we take the negative row 20, we count up 8, and we get... Oh, that's not right, actually. That's negative 12. Okay, okay, so we'll take the negative 10 row and count up 8, and that's... No, no, that's something that's not right there either. That's negative 2. It's confusing. I'll be the first to admit it. But when the values are negative, just remember this. Do the math to find your path. Now, negative 18 is greater than negative 10, negatively speaking. So the next row up is negative 20. Now, if we take the negative 20 and we subtract negative 18, that becomes positive 2. So this tells you to go to the negative 20 row and count over to the 2 column, and you get negative 0.896. We go over 2 because negative 20 plus 1 column would be negative 19, plus 2 would be negative 18. If you look at the values in the columns themselves, it's pretty easy. Above 0, the values increase as you go higher in the count, left to right. But on the negative side of the zero, the numbers decrease in negative value, which means they're going positive. They're actually still adding. In your class from the first week, you were given a bundle, and in that bundle was a complete J-type table. I would strongly recommend practicing this a few times, especially working with negative values. This is important to remember. It might be on a test, like um, your first job at instrumentation. Okay, that was a lot of work to figure out negative voltages, but fortunately, we don't have to do that right now. Let's get back to the problem at hand. So we found that at zero Celsius, the voltage was zero millivolts. Let's plug that into our equation. We can now calculate the voltage of the measuring junction. The total is 1.9 millivolts, so our measuring voltage is 1.9 millivolts. With our final voltage determined, all we have to do now is to go back to the tables to determine what 1.9 millivolts tells us. Hunting down the 1.9, we find it under the 7 column and the 30 row. So 30 plus 7 gives us 37 degrees Celsius. This method of ice bathing the junction is called cold junction measuring. Here, cold means cold, as in freezing. Since all thermocouples use the freezing point of water to set their reference, you can always eliminate the reference voltage concerned if you lower the temperature of that junction to freezing. Let's work through an example. Here we have a very simple thermocouple circuit. Let's start by analyzing it. Which is the reference junction? If you guess B, you're right. Which junction is the measuring junction? 
If you guessed A, you're right again. Junction C is what we were referring to as the extension junction. Okay, so let's work through this. What is the measuring junction temperature if the junction voltage is 0 0.749 millivolts and the ambient temperature is negative 5 degrees Celsius? So here is the formula we need. The voltage at the measuring junction is equal to the extension junction's voltage less the reference junction voltage. Remember too that if you get a result that is negative here, then the measuring junction is colder than the reference junction. So what do we know so far? Well, we know the reference voltage is, so we'll plug that in. And now we're going to need to use the chart to determine the expected voltage for negative 5 degrees C. Okay, here we have a negative number, so we're speaking negatively. Let's remind ourselves that the first value in the zero column on the left is the same value as the next row on the 10 column. Okay, so do the math, find the path, great. Okay, now negative 5 is greater, again, negatively speaking, than 0, so we move up to the negative 10 row. Now we do our math. So if we take uh, negative 10 and we subtract a negative 5, and the whole thing's in the negative, that comes out to plus 5. So we move to the right, or up, to the 5 column, and the magic answer is negative 0 0.251 millivolts. So now all we have to do is plug in the missing numbers and calculate the measuring junction voltage. So 0 0.749 millivolts minus negative 0 0.251 millivolts, which means a negative times a negative is positive, so that gives us 0 0.749 plus 0 0.251, which equals 1 millivolt. Now all we need to do is look up the temperature. 1 millivolt is between 9 or 10, but remember it's on the 10 row, so the temperature is between 19 or 20. So let's call it 19.5 degrees Celsius. So what happens when the ice melts or the hermetic seal gets broken? You, you mean somebody is going to be constantly checking the water temperature and checking the seal? Really? Isn't that kind of like against the whole thing? Like we could have just looked at the thermometer. Well, somebody is. Introducing the PTC of necessity, the resistor with the persistence, the sensor of the temperature, the RTD that likes to freeze, the hero of the zero, and the one, the only, Mr. Thermistor. Yes, a thermistor. We know that they can act as a thermal switch, but we can also monitor its change in resistance and use that to calculate the temperature of the J2 and J3 junctions. We simply put the thermistor in the isothermic block and it will measure the temperature. Hooray! For Mr. Thermistor! This method of using thermal resistor or thermistors is called cold junction compensation. All modern temperature transmitters have this feature. So if the reference junction is measured at say 14 degrees, then the transmitter compensates for the shift and accurately calculates the measuring junction's voltage and hence its temperature. The voltages produced by a thermocouple are very small. In almost all instances, they'll have to be amplified to an industry standard signal. Thermocouples can be connected to digital or analog indicators, transmitters, or controllers. Most of these devices have a cold junction compensation, so an ice bath is not necessary. This is an example of a temperature controller. There are two different wiring diagrams for two different models available. Both of them will monitor and control the process variable. Okay, 
In 10 seconds, identify each one. Go. Okay, time's up. If you guess that, that the one on the left is for an RTD, you're correct. The one on the left is for a thermocouple. This is clearly seen by the one on the left having 3, 4, and 5 connected to a device, whereas the one on the right, 4 and 5 are connected to positive and negative. Okay, here's another quick question. What is the process variable? If you said it's 200 degrees C, you were right. What is the set point? It's the same at 200. So right now, the unit is satisfied. Here's a great example of some sophisticated technology in a little package. It's probably in your kitchen. This is an electric thermometer. Inside that little box, you get a voltage to temperature conversion, in other words, a transducer, a cold junction compensation, and a digital readout, all for the ridiculously low, low price of, well, whatever they cost. Okay, we've covered a lot of ground, so let's take a moment and do some review. First of all, the hot junction. It's not necessarily hot. It's also known as the measuring junction, which is probably a better name for it. The cold junction is not necessarily cold. It's also known as the reference junction, which is a better name for it. The Seebeck effect only generates voltage when? Well, when there's a difference in temperature between two junctions and you're using dissimilar metals to create the effect. If the measuring junction is warmer than the reference, then the voltage is positive. So by extension, what does that mean if it's negative? Well, then that means that the reference junction is warmer than the measuring junction. Okay, now we're going to spend a bit of time practicing some of the stuff we've learned. Remember that the voltage read at the extension junction is the sum of the two other junctions. And you cannot directly measure the voltage of the measured junction at the reference junction because you are creating another thermocouple circuit. Okay, here is our first example. A thermocoupler's measuring junction is placed in the process stream. The extension wires are extended to the voltmeter leads. This generates a measured voltage of 7.78 millivolts. Using the charts, what is the temperature? Well, before we go there, we have to ask ourselves a couple questions. First of all, what is the type of thermocouple? Well, since they're using iron and constantan, that would make it a J-type. Number two, is the J2 and J3 junctions at 32 degrees Fahrenheit or zero Celsius? Well, they're in an ice bath, so yes. So now we can go to the chart. Okay, scouring the chart, we find 7.789. And if I look and find its location, it's in the 6 column. And I shoot across to my left, and it's 140. So 140 plus 6 gives us a temperature of 146 degrees Celsius. Okay, here's one that's going to work the other way. We have a type J. What would the expected voltage be if it was 15 degrees Celsius? All right, so the first thing we do is we have to find 10 in the left-hand column. So we have our plus 10, and then we shoot across until we find the 5 column, and where they two meet, we find it reads 0.762 millivolts. <laughs> 